Hey guys, this is your High Fist again with another juicy video. Before we get started, I just have a few quick things to say. Firstly, thank you once again to Steven Erickson for not only leaving behind this encouragement, but for sharing the last two videos on Facebook as well. And as you can see from the views, when he gives us a shout out, we get a significantly larger chunk of Malazan fans who watch the video. Obviously, I'm on a, a hat trick right now for for those of you who follow uh, cricket or football or, or soccer, as some of you might say, uh, you know what it's like to be on a hat-trick and uh, it might be an ice hockey term as well, I'm not too sure. So, yeah, so here's hoping that Eric Erickson uh, gives us that coveted uh, hat-trick. We can leave him alone after this, right? Because uh, I do have some fun stuff planned ahead that he perhaps wouldn't or shouldn't be sharing. Uh, I don't just want this to be sort of a, a, a channel where we go deep into the philosophical side of things. I do want to do some juvenile, funny uh, sort of videos as well, like uh, let's say a deep dive into toilet humor in, in the Malazan series. Uh, trust me, there is a lot of it in the series, right? Or whatever. Why fans of anime should uh, get into the Malazan series if they feel that they're ready to graduate to the next level of storytelling and stuff like that. So. Uh, there are a couple of videos I have in the pipeline, which I'm not too sure he would care about. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, I mean, let's see, let's see whether we get that hat trick from him with this uh, video as well. Uh, the other quick thing I wanted to mention was that some of you wanted spoiler tags and spoiler warnings uh, on my videos. I understand the sentiment and I thank you for appreciating it, but I don't think it would be the right thing for me to do at this point. Most of my uh, videos are meant to be spoiler video so if i start putting up a warning on one then i'd have to follow that and start putting spoiler warnings and spoiler tags for every single video that i do and that just sounds like a nightmare so i think it's better to just assume that this entire channel will be full of spoilers for people uh, who haven't finished reading the 10 big books and uh, sort of uh, that would be better right because uh, i can't really think of myself now having to create spoiler content, spoiler free content and uh, making that distinction, all of that would be uh, uh, a, a, a real, as I said, a, a nightmare, right? So uh, I, I apologize in advance. Uh, I hope you understand, but this will be a complete spoiler channel and therefore it's better for every video to be treated as a, as a spoiler video. Uh, I know that this, this channel can probably grow a lot faster and certainly a lot bigger if I put out spoil, uh, spoiler content but uh, I would much rather this just be a dedicated uh, channel for in-depth discussion into the 10 big books, uh, even if that means remaining a small channel, right? Because if you, if you guys don't mind me saying this, there are plenty of places around where uh, Malazan discussions can be had without spoilers, but it's almost like those of us who've read the 10 books don't really have a place. Uh, uh, most of the Discord servers have these spoiler channels and you're not allowed to discuss spoilers anywhere else. Uh, uh, internet forums, Reddit forums, uh, often people seem to freak out when they perceive something to be a spoiler. So it kind of feels like those of us who've read the 10 books and don't re uh, are the ones who don't really have a place. We are, we are people without land, right? Uh, so to speak. We are the, how about this? We are the taste and the and I am Anamanda Rake, even though I did a, a video uh, about a week ago about why I think Anamanda Rake's overrated, uh, it, it suits this analogy. I am Anamanda Rake, and unlike the real one, I will lead my people into the promised land. Uh, the promised land, of course, being this channel. And if you don't like that analogy, then here's another one. Uh, you are the Tulan Aimas who made this vow, and you now just want to rest, but you don't have a place to call your own. And I am Itkovian. You know, yeah, I, I like that a lot better. So let's go with that. I am Fakrek, right? Uh, I am Itkovian, and this channel is your dream world. I'm here to take your grief, let your memories of ice, let your memories of reading the 10 big books manifest in this realm. I am here to take your pain, right? So, uh, with that, we can actually start the video. So I'm sorry, guys, this will always be a spoiler channel. And the actual video starts in three, two, one. OK, guys, I completely screwed that up. Not only did I mess up the countdown, but I also realized that I've got to move to a new place because the old one was uh, windy. So I apologize for my disastrous uh, editing skills, but uh, I've, I've at least managed to pull out my notes. So 
we can get this video started. So I've always wanted to do something on Ericsson's handle, uh, Ericsson's handling of not only nationhood and empire, but civilization in totality. And there are clearly many books and many stories, sub stories in which he discusses those themes in detail. And there is clearly no way for every story to be featured in one video because that video would be eight, maybe 10 hours long. So I said to myself, why not pick one of my favorites out of those and just focus on that. And therefore we have our juicy topic today. The Kasa Along and Samar Dev journey, their first journey, right? Uh, which is the Bone Hunters and Reaper's Gale. Kasa is obviously one of the most uh, well-known characters in the series because he's such a badass. But I typically find the discussion surrounding him to either focus on his House of Chains shenanigans or the later on stuff like him defeating Rulad and running into Traveller, killing Fenner, blah, blah, blah. This, the middle portion of his story, his first journey with her, where he kind of makes it all the way to Rulad from the time he leaves Raraku until he actually gets to facing Rulad. Uh, that is something I don't see discussed as often, which is a shame because this is where Ericsson does some of his best work in building Kasa because this is where Ericsson uh, shows that he's a great character beyond his badassery. Yes, he's strong. Yes, he's powerful. But he's a compelling character beyond that. And uh, Kasa is such a sort of greatly written creation because he is a microcosm for barbarism, right? Uh, uh, he's a microcosm for it in a way that typical barbarian characters in fiction are not. Which now brings me to the second reason I wanted to do this video. Samar Dev, one of the most fantastic characters in the entire series and uh, one of the best examples of why Ericsson is so good at writing female characters, especially in the Bone Hunters and uh, Reaper's Gate. Just as how we see Kasa function as a microcosm for barbarism, she functions as a microcosm for uh, civilization. Uh, she takes absolutely no shit from him and it's, uh, it, there are many, many hilarious scenes with them. Uh, she's super smart, she's super competent and sort of in their back and forth, there is a self-contained story about the duality of civilization and barbarism. Because these two characters uh, embody these two, uh, to borrow a phrase from my previous video, uh, diametrically opposite spectrums, uh, it's it's sort of something which on the one hand makes their story this unlikely romance, right? Uh, it's a love story between a barbarian and a scholar. It's a kind of a, a beauty and the beast, sort of it's a, I guess, a twisted version of uh, the beauty and the beast. But on the other hand, it's also a deeply intellectual exploration of civilization and barbarism, particularly uh, the debate between character traits that form a barbarian and character traits that form what we consider to be civilized. So uh, we get to their first meeting, which is great because it starts off as a damsel in distress type story, which is amusing in hindsight because Samar Dev is not a damsel in distress, but uh, this is one of the typical things that Erickson does, right? Where he starts something off with a sort of overdone cliche and he then says, oh, haha, look, you fool, I've completely subverted that cliche and, and we kind of look like idiots, right? So she's created this automatic carriage that doesn't need horses. And she's been demonstrating it to this rich guy to fund her research. And this rich guy has completely screwed it up. And the, the, the carriage has now crumbled. He's dead and her leg is broken. And she sort of resigned to her fate. She thinks she's going to die. And out from the horizon rides this massive barbarian on a massive horse with a massive sword. And he's got these two heads of the hounds of uh, uh, shadow uh, behind him. She's worried that he might hurt her, but he doesn't. And he agrees to help her if she helps him get inside the city that she's from. And, and she, of course, agrees. She doesn't know Kasa, right? So 
she agrees thinking that this guy would behave himself and we of course know that uh, he wouldn't and as soon as they reach the town trouble starts because casa is casa right the instant they reach a guard comes up to them and he's like oh you can't bring that here and casa doesn't say a word to him he just picks the guy up and throws him the guy goes sailing through the air and crashes into an empty cart nearby and she she is like what are you doing so for the in the first of many times she gets a taste of how unpredictable casa is and then there's a great scene where uh, alarm bells start ringing uh, and and he's completely unfazed by it right she is freaking out when she hears the alarm bells because she knows that the city garrison is now about to sort of all uh, approach together and he doesn't care he just says oh i'm hungry we won't find me an inn right uh, find my house a stable he is completely uh, unaffected by it so even in a comedy scene like that look at the way that erickson contrasts barbarism with civilization uh, how would we react if we did something and police sirens just went off and we knew the cops were on their way most of us would freak out because most of us are creatures of civilization right uh, which is based on order and based on the assumption that the state can use violence in order to enforce this order that the state has the right to use violence to enforce this order against sort of a individual citizen so trespass on the writ of the law or whatever right he doesn't give a shit casa all along does not give a shit and it's a rejection of a of a, of a trait that comes with the with the civilized so the guards arrive and she then talks them out of attacking him right uh, because she's smart and now we find out that she's not really some hapless academic either she is a respected and even feared witch in the city and here's where sort of she's once again such a, a effective embodiment of uh, what we would consider civilization so she is a polymath right so she has a very wide range of uh, knowledge uh, she sort of uh, she's not just a witch she's an inventor she's a doctor she's a linguist she's a cartographer she knows so much of malazan history and later on we see her recognizing words like preda and segule as first empire words she knows who grillin is she knows there's a rat devers out there called grillin she has to be one of the most knowledgeable people in the series she seems to know about whiskey jack and the bridge burners when she talks to the uh, the aniba uh, tribesmen so she manages to convince the guards to leave right it's a funny scene we can't go into all of that unfortunately but uh, uh, the guards then leave and we once again get this great back and forth where he realizes that she's a witch and he's like isn't if if you were a witch why did you not just summon a, a spirit out there to heal your leg why were you just there waiting to die and she said oh look those uh, those spirits in places like that those are evil spirits and if you sort of bargain with them they might be the ones who trick you and kasa just laughs and says oh if you have to bargain with those spirits then you can't really be that strong because his definition of strength is completely different uh, so there's another uh, interesting contrast with that right where this civilizational obsession with contracts negotiation bargaining barter where every transaction every agreement has to be governed by an elaborate piece of paper with all these bargains and sub bargains put into that piece of paper casa rejects all that because he sees that as a product of civilization so in their first scene together erickson is immediately as i just discussed establishes that these two are microcosms for barbarism and civilization and that this will serve the dual purpose of being both a love story and a platform for this much larger debate between these two the next day is when kasa goes into the keep and he has a huge fight with the kachain naruk i wish i could spend more time on that fight but unfortunately it's not relevant for this particular topic maybe we can touch on it some day in another kasa video but uh, he goes in there and he fights that thing with his bare hands and it's an awesome scene there is a really cool autopsy scene later right with some of them once again contrasting the two of them kasa along beats up and kills the kachain naruk while summer dev dissects it and and sort of studies it and the scene is described so clinically as she's kind of uh, performing this type this postmortem type uh, 
analysis on that corpse. When we finally get a Kasa along Samadev scene the next day, it's one of the best scenes that they share. To date, it's one of their best scenes. It's where sort of he is in her uh, lab and he is examining some of the things that she has in her lab, right? So some of her inventions he likes. He understands once he once she explains it to him, like there's a there's a telescope, for example. And uh, even though he kind of scoffs at it at the beginning, once she describes the utility of it, uh, he understands. There's one scene where she has this elaborate chemistry set, chemistry type uh, set type apparatus, where uh, he sort of looks at it and he's like, "What is this for?" And she gets really excited, right? And she's like, "Oh, the the top beaker is to remove the impurities in the water. It then gets filtered to the bottom where it gets mixed with copper. It then gets filtered into the third where it's churned to create a whatever an ethereal property, blah blah blah." And Casa just stops her and has, and says, "Oh, but." What is it all for? And she doesn't have an answer. She just says nothing in particular. And she's like embarrassed about it, right? The, the funniest scene between the two of them at this phase has to be where Kasa eats hemorrhoid cream. Yes, guys, there is literally a scene in the series where Kasa Along, right, the embodiment of badassery, eats hemorrhoid cream. So he's examining a, a lot of stuff in, in her lab and she sees him examining this uh, this uh, gelatinous sort of uh, substance in one of the in one of the petri dishes uh, that she has there and she just lets him taste it because she says it's not fatal so let him try it kasa then licks it and he says this is awful what is it and she says why don't you guess and he says uh, it's probably something that you use for leather on saddles and she says in a way it's for uh, the sort of uh, uh, the the wounds that sometimes arise in the lining of the anus, aka hemorrhoids, right? So that's a that's a hemorrhoid cream. And Casa says, "Oh, but no wonder it tastes awful." That's a it's a hilarious scene. And and then once that happens, he sees her maps, and he then decides that he has to go on this big journey to now unite his uh, Tablakai people and then sort of. Uh, gather an army to wipe out civilization blah 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 and even though his ideals terrify her she's fascinated by him and she decides to travel with him and in that sense doesn't she just parallel us the readers right we are frightened by him but we are fascinated by him as well and this keeps being brought up right uh, in her own monologues and later on when he kind of says it out as well both sides are aware that uh, Kasa frightens Samardev, but uh, he kind of fascinates her as well, and that strengthens their bond. So, just before their journey starts, they have another interesting conversation on the nature of automation, right? I mean, how many other epic fantasy shows do we have where we can get a conversation like that, where she shows him one of his carriages and she says, in the future, people wouldn't need horses because she started creating these uh, carriages that you can drive without a horse. And Kasa Along says, what kind of world would that be, right? What kind of world would it be where anybody can travel anywhere? Once again, contrast that to where we are in 2020, where most of us say we can't wait to start traveling again. We can't wait until things normalize again. And what we mean by normalize, right, a big part of it is us being able to go out, is us being able to travel. What we tend to see as a natural part of life and as an enjoyable part of life because we're civilized, Kasa sees as something that has to be earned, right? It's so different uh, from, from, from what uh, we sort of do. Just before sort of uh, uh, they run into the Aniba, the, the next argument they kind of have is a minor one about the, about the simplicity of life. But uh, that's interesting as well because he comes out and he says, oh, feel the wind as they sort of leave the city. And he says the, the sense of this wind is so much better than thousands of noises that erupt from that city and and she doesn't really sort of agree with that at all and she snaps back because she's the type of person who believes that achievement pursuit repetition uh, what she calls ritual those are the things that she believes give meaning to humanity our accomplishments our inventions and she even says this she says convenience cannot be evil right 
you as a barbarian can't really look at all of these things that we've done. You can't discuss, you can't dismiss rather materialism as being an evil thing simply because it's materialism. So she's a materialist, but she's a moral materialist. Uh, she, we often find her sort of uh, having this internal conversation with her about how an inventor has to sort of be wary of uh, the purposes for which their inventions can be used, which is again another major uh, problem, moral dilemma that civilization has always had, that great minds in civilization have always had, right? Uh, contributing towards knowledge is one thing, but uh, what if that's used for some kind of immoral purpose? Would we be okay with that? She, she even calls it uh, uh, Dave's first law of the universe or something like that, right? Where sort of she explains that one of her laws is that the invention, the application of the invention itself shouldn't have the potential to harm uh, humanity if it's used for uh, negative uh, purposes, blah, blah, blah. And Kasa just says, more laws, right? You people are obsessed with laws. So that's the two of them. And as they set along on this journey, they finally encounter the wilderness. And as they go there, she finds that he seems to be so at home there. So back when they were in the city, she was in her element and he was the, the alien, so to speak. But now that they're traveling through this dense forest, uh, she is the alien and he is the native. And he seems that even the scene where he kills the, the, the Bedouin bulls, right? Uh, uh, once again, I can't go into the action scenes and all that because this video would become too long. But uh, there's a great scene where he, he, he refers to the herd, the Bedouin herd as a harem. Right. And he says, look, the, the male will protect. He's, he's not going to leave the 10 females that he can protect in order to now charge and fight for the one female that has been cut away from the pack. Right. Uh, and he kind of uses Summer Dave as bait. And it's a funny scene. It's a good action scene. It's one of the first instances where he uses the word witness just as a word. Right. She says, listen, you're crazy. You can't do this. Please stop because he wants to kill a Bedouin by himself and he just says witness and and he does it after that while they're together is when the the Anibar tribe comes and this is where the story then gets into the next phase right where the boat finder is the one who talks to him so they're this tribe that is just getting slaughtered by the teast Edo uh, and Rulard is obviously uh, behind it all and uh, it's a it's, it's a it's a very good scene for Kasa actually because it's it's a great scene which shows how sympathetic Kaza is and how noble Kaza is. Because first, the Aniba come with a bone, right? With this huge penis bone as an offering. And Kaza says, listen, that's not really an offering. That's just barter, right? So Kaza rejects religion. If you remember, even his sort of, his journey itself in many ways starts off by rejecting the sort of the unbound. Right, starts off by rejecting the religion that he sees as having kept the tebla trapped and having made the tebla weak in, in his eyes. So he rejects religion and he says, this is not really an offering. It's just barter, right? You're just here to barter. And then sort of he's talked into it. But when he finds out what's been happening to the Anibar, right? When he finds out that these tall, ghostly sort of uh, foreigners have just been coming in and butchering them for no reason. And it, it's a pretty sad scene as well because the because boat finders like, is it our fault for not being able to defend ourselves? What did we do to deserve this? We have no idea what gave them such offense. We have no idea why they are so offended that they torture us and kill us in these brutal ways. And he just seems so helpless. And Kasa says, do not feel ashamed. It's not your fault, right? Uh, Kasa, who is the first to kind of dismiss people for being weak and being helpless and all that in this instance he immediately sees the shame that they have and he says cast your shame away these slayers these monsters they have no reason for slaying but now that i am here i will kill every single one of them and this is this is where he kind of starts to make an oath that he will kill them all and summer dev kind of talks him out of it right so they kind of have this tempering influence on each other where she standing for civilization is managed to calm down the barbarian in him a bit and he as the barbarian is able to kind of uh, 
make her embrace her wild side, such as her abandoning the safety of her city and going on this journey with him, right? Which in a sense was him bringing out the, the, the wild side in her. So anyway, so she calms him down and she kind of just convinces him that uh, chasing the Edor away will be enough. And he sort of agrees. So they go in pursuit of, uh, of the Edor, right? So once again, they have a big journey. Uh, we get another example of how Samar Dev is so smart because when Boatfinder tells them about their mythology with uh, uh, Ishka Jarak and all that, she grasps it instantly, right? They have this very simple concept of the flowing time, the of, of the frozen time, the flowing time, and the unfound time, right? So the the frozen time is the past; it's frozen. The flowing time is the present. It's infinitely malleable and unpredictable. And the unfound time is the future. We have no idea what that would be. And she instantly figures out in this one conversation that this is how it works. And even both finders impress and it's like, you honor us with your wisdom and all that. So uh, she she's also, she seems to realize that Ishka Jarak is Whiskey Jack. Uh, I have no idea uh, how she does, but uh, just from the way that he sort of characterizes things she's like is ishka jalaka mesla and he's like right and is he on a bridge yes and is the bridge burning blah 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 she figures it out uh, uh, instantly here uh, once again we sort of see this uh, uh, we, we get to this epic scene of just how badass kasa is right because he now comes into this whole uh, uh, what do i say this camp where he finds a lot of dead people and Kasa just keeps running faster and faster and faster and she kind of has to catch up with him in a sense and by the time she comes to the clearing she finds a whole bunch of freshly dead corpses and Kasa is facing off against more than 50 Edo soldiers and she thinks they're going to cut him down and of course she's wrong. He cuts them down. He goes on this massive rampage where he just kind of dismantles their entire thing, right? And he just keeps fighting and fighting and fighting. And finally, once again, she talks him down. She calms him down. And she says, look, even if you kill these guys, more will come. Even if you just slaughter everybody you see here, more of them will come. And he finally kind of says, hmm, so what do you suggest? She's like, just tell them that you are the first in a Toblakai army that's coming. And that if these guys ever come back here again, they will all get slaughtered. But the TST would have their own plans, right? They see this guy fighting and ding, we have a champion. So they then speak to Kasa and they invite Kasa to come along. And Kasa's like, what, do these guys just want me to come and kill their champion? And she's like, yes, they do, right? And so Kasa agrees. Samardev thinks it's a horrible idea, but uh, once Kasa's uh, set on something, you can't really change his mind. So he decides that he is now heading there to fight Rurad and Samardev agrees to come with him, right? Uh, one funny scene that I wanted to mention, which I forgot to in uh, before we get to Reaper's Gale. In, in the Bone Hunters, there's a really funny scene where they are trekking through the jungle and... Uh, uh, Boat finder and some of them have this conversation about the frozen time and all that. And there's a good contrast because she keeps saying that she can't, when, where Kasa sees the wilderness and he sees the beauty in it, she just sees unharvested trees. She's constantly thinking of more efficient ways in which the Anibar could kind of transport their grain. She's thinking of her feet get kind of uh, swollen as she walks. So she's already thinking of multi-layer technology that she should create for uh, shoes. So she's always thinking of efficiency. She's always thinking of ways in which things can be improved. And she starts feeling guilty about it uh, as well. Another good uh, contrast where she looks at how things can be harnessed while Kasa would see that as exploitation. And he looks at the beauty in the natural world while Samadev would argue that that's just going to waste, right? Another funny scene I just want to mention before we move on to uh, Reaper's Gale is where uh, as they walk through, there are flies and mosquitoes uh, bothering her, right? Uh, harassing her. And 
uh, the anibar all have these uh, twigs and leaves sort of things uh, used as scarves and they wrap their heads around it and this kind of repels the mosquitoes which is quite reminiscent of many sort of uh, tribal cultures and things like that who use uh, neem and uh, eucalyptus and things like that to repel uh, pests right so uh, they kind of use this and she she is harassed and bothered by the mosquitoes and flies but she kind of doesn't want to wear that because she thinks it looks absolutely ridiculous right she's like i am not wearing that it looks ridiculous even if it protects them from the flies and the mosquitoes and all that so once again a funny trait of civilization that's being contrasted in this journey towards the uh, towards the wilderness so that's where we are with uh, the bone hunters and after that starts reaper's game right so with the magic of my editing skills we're back and we will now look at reaper's gale the casa summer journey in reaper's gale right so re this uh, presents a kind of new turn in their journey because letter in many ways as they arrive is an alien place for both of them it's an alien place for casa because it's civilization and he's a barbarian but it's also an alien place for summer day because she sees the civilization that she's been defending against the barbs of casa all along for this journey she sees that sort of crumbling in letter right when she sees what rulard is doing and she sees that this entire thing is a total uh, horror show uh, before we go further in there i just realized that there were a couple of things that i kind of wanted to uh, discuss from the bone hunters which i didn't especially one scene right uh, because i even have a, a quote from uh, that scene where Kasa and Samardev, as they're traveling through the jungle, Kasa talks about how this place is full of uh, bad omens and spirits, and she says that the she kind of turns a bit arrogant at that, and she says, "Oh, the people of the seven cities probably believe that once as well, right? Uh, we were probably once uh, superstitious and simple as well." And she says, and here's a quote: "Fortunately, we left all that behind. We discovered the glory." of civilization right so this is how she sees it she sees the way he thinks as something that is a primitive part of her own tradition and heritage but that they've moved ahead from it they've moved ahead from all that superstition and they can now move into civilization but kasa then of course responds by saying oh yes of course you people are good at civilization is better right it's better at killing people is better at subjugating people it's better at taking slaves blah 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 and once again so the beauty of these conversations is that nobody really is the clear winner erickson does not show civilization winning out over barbarism or barbarism winning out over civilization in this in these sort of uh, uh, back and forth it's always kept open it's not like let's say lostara yil and pearl where pearl is clearly the witty guy and she's the one sort of exacerbated by what he's saying or on the sort of uh, flip side of it uh, talk and lady envy in the third book where lady envy is clearly the wittier one and talk is the one who's kind of overwhelmed by sort of everything that she says here there is no clear winner when they go back and forth and that's a really nice touch to it right because we are kind of allowed to decide whom we side with at one point of time uh, she runs into a uh, Taxilian as well. Uh, I just want to talk, touch on uh, Taxilian as a character because, uh, for many of you who might not know, uh, Taxila is a, a is a, a real place and ancient sort of uh, university in uh, ancient India. It was a place where many scholars from around the world uh, uh, gathered, right, to study. And the fact that there's a uh, there's a guy here who claims to be from Taxila, and he also claims to speak the Taxilian scholar dialect. that kind of gave me ancient uh, indian sort of uh, vibes uh, there was one scene where uh, takshilian even tells uh, samardev when they meet on the edor boat or, or the edor ship rather right that uh, his grandmother is from a tribe called rangala or something like that which i'm sure is a coincidence because rangala is a place in sri lanka right it's a place a couple of hours away from where i live it's like this uh, pond that a lot of trekkers like going to so that has to be a coincidence i mean come on itkovian cannot be uh, an indian guy with a sri lankan grandmother right because he says his grandmother's from rangala and she taught him all these uh, 
uh, because Amardev says that's an extinct relig uh, 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 language, right? You, you couldn't know that. And he says, oh, no, my grandmother's still alive. I, I know that religion. So maybe he's an Indian with like a Sri Lankan grandmother, guys. I mean, of all the Malazan characters to share genetic traits with, why does it have to be him? Why couldn't it be uh, Bauchelain or Quick Ben or Tehol or someone like that? But anyway... Listen, we might find out that Bautilain was uh, was Sri Lankan all along, right? Who knows? If, if you are going to uh, be greedy, then you might as well dream big, right? So anyway, so uh, she meets uh, Takshilin and all that. And in Reaper's Gale, she kind of uh, travels around with him a bit, while Kasa kind of does his own thing a bit as well. But the two of them constantly kind of uh, meet each other and uh, trade these barbs and their relationship gets stronger. So how it starts off in Reaper's Gale is... There's a rat that's scurrying around and we just see the rat and all of a sudden a hand, a big hand reaches out of the shadows and it just breaks that rat's uh, neck, right? It just kills that rat. And it's, it turns out to be Samardev and Kasa. And Samardev is like, uh, oh, that's an invitation to disease, right? You're killing rats with your bare hands. That's an invitation to disease. And Kasa just says, life is an invitation to disease. So once again, as soon as they're introduced, Erickson uses humor to sort of emphasize this uh, dichotomy between the two, right? Uh, Erickson uses uh, his sort of, uh, uh, his use of humor to once again clearly remind us that not only is this a story about the two of them, but this is a much larger debate over the nature of, I, I don't want to keep uh, repeating it over and over again, but over the nature of barbarism and civilization. As they walk into the sort of, uh, 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 as they walk into leather, they get off the boat and they get into leather, this escort party arrives, right? And the escort party is like, we are here to take you back to the compound and you cannot carry that sword outside. And even if you are given permission uh, sort of to, to leave the compound, it has to be whatever, uh, approved by one of the commanders, blah, 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 blah. Kasa doesn't speak. Once again, Kasa just grabs the guy and he throws him onto the other guys and more people come and he punches them. He just kicks all their asses, right? And uh, this time he doesn't need Samardev to tell him to calm down because she's like, oh, here we go again, right? She's like, someone just kill me. She is so petrified that as soon as they get there, all of this happens. And Kasa just says, oh, listen, if you guys are my escort, then you guys better be civil. If you want to take me to the compound or whatever, that's fine. But you will speak to me like I am your sort of, uh, I am your redemption because I am, I'm here to kill this emperor of yours. And he then turns around and starts screaming at the, the Edor on the ship, right? He's like, where's my horse? I'm tired of waiting. Bring my horse here. So here, as soon as they kind of uh, go in, she immediately, once she walks around and starts finding out more about Rulard, she starts doubting him. And one of the major things that we see in Reaper's Gale is this internal conflict between her, which is also mirrored in us as the readers, right? Because uh, Kasa, go, Icarium's there as well. So if Kasa goes first and Icarium goes last, does that mean Kasa is going to lose? Does that mean Ericsson will now kill Kasa? These are all the things that we are worried about as readers as well. And but but there's this other side of us which keeps telling us, oh come on, man, it's it's Kasa all along. He's not going to die. He's not going to be defe uh, defeated by Rulat. But there's this sense of fear in the back of our head all the time. And uh, Samardev captures this a lot. One of her big conflicts in this book is, on the one hand, she knows that Kasa is not normal. She knows that Kasa is more or less unstoppable. But on the other hand, she actually sees Rulat. And she sees Rula just decimating whoever he's put against. And she starts doubting Kasa's chances of survival. And this kind of starts making her like him even more, right? If, if, if that makes sense. This is where she, sorry, this is where she sees the Segule among the many challenges. And she uh, instantly identifies that, uh, that as a, a word. Uh, the word is anvil. Segule means anvil in the first empire language is what she tells us and she also speculates that they are perhaps a race who helped the empire win some big war and sort of uh, given some kind of island to settle in and sort of uh, live on for the rest of their generations blah 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 she then goes around and does uh, a couple of uh, some stuff with Taxilian because uh, he kind of brings up the whole 
uh, Icarium, many different temples there, blah, blah, blah. That's an entire story, right? Uh, I might do a video somewhere later down the line on what exactly happened at the end of Reaper's Gale because a lot of people don't seem to get it about uh, Icarium's machinery and what he was doing at the end. And there's an earthquake that happens when he uh, arrives in Letter and Tuxilian later tells Summer Dev that uh, the only thing that was destroyed in this earthquake was some kind of rat temple. Right, so there are these uh, mechanisms all over the city that is, that was built by Icarium a long ago, and it uses kind of uh, elder blood to create its own warren and blah blah blah. So she's sort of involved in that for a while. The real sort of uh, uh, tension between them in Reaper's Gale comes when uh, she sort of uh, she's in her room, and the ghost of Sida Kuru Khan from Midnight Tides comes and asks her to save, uh, to save uh, Feather Witch, right? And Summer Dev refuses because Summer Dev has had a very bad experience with Feather Witch. So just before they land, Feather Witch, she had already noticed Feather Witch with the uh, Teast Edur in the Bone Hunters when they invite Kasa to join him. On the ship, Feather Witch asks uh, Summer Dev to teach her the common tongue and Summer Dev uh, sort of uh, refuses. Because Feather Witch tells her that Tuxilian is teaching her, she, she suspects that he is not teaching her the right language and she's right. He's teaching her a mix of many different languages just to confuse her. And Samar Dev says, no, I, I, I won't teach you shit, right? Get lost. And Feather Witch even says, I can have you killed. I'll have the captain kind of kill you. And Samar Dev just says, listen, do you have any idea what, ha what would happen to me if you kill me? Kasa would kill all of you, right? And Summer Dev then feels guilty that she she starts looking that she has started looking at Kasa all along as a tool as well, right? Because one of the things that she starts uh, judging the other people around her for is for wanting to use Kasa as a tool. And she keeps saying, "Don't these idiots realize that this barbarian cannot be anybody's tool? He just does what he wants." And then she kind of uh, uh, feels a little guilty that she starts seeing him as a tool as well. But anyway. The spirit of Sida Kuru Khan appears and begs her to heal Feather Witch. And she says, I, w I, I won't, right? This bitch uh, threatened to get, have me killed when we were on the ship together on our way here. So I'm not helping. And then in an uncharacteristic move, because until then we have seen Summer Dev have a very strong moral compass about what her inventions will be used for. She uses her knife to slash through the ghost of Sida Kuru Khan and she imprisons him, right? Uh, which completely goes against her principles. And I guess we can almost see it as the barbarian coming out in this civilizational embodiment that she is. Kasa then later barges into a room and she's like, Ma'am, how, how the hell did you get in here? I have enough wards placed around this room to sort of stop a god, right? Uh, how the hell did you just walk in here and barge in here? so effortlessly and and Kasa just says, uh, I don't care for your damn words, right? I care nothing for your damn words, uh, is what I think she says. Uh, he says. So then Kasa realizes what she's done. He realizes that she has now imprisoned a soul against its will uh, it, in her knife, right? And, she ki and he kind of uh, says, I thought you weren't into all this. I thought you didn't believe this. And look at the contrasting justification uh, that they give, right? So I have a quote, a summer day quote here. It's it's a pretty long quote, so I hope I don't uh, mess this up, right? So she is essentially telling him that she had no choice, that being with him is corrupting her. Being with him is changing her. Being with him is turning her wild, according to her, right? It's once again, the civilized turning into the barbarian. So she blames the barbarism part for this. And here's the quote. She tells Kasa this. You present the quaint and appalling argument that through willful ignorance of the laws and rules of the universe, you cannot suffer their influence. As you might imagine, your very success poses evidence of that tenet. And it's one I cannot reconcile since it runs contrary to a lifetime of observation. Right. So this is, I would say, one of the best Summer Day quotes that kind of it's a capsule for everything that she feels around them. And it's a capsule for everything that we as the reader sometimes feel about Kasa all along as well, right? So uh, let's just go through that uh, slowly again. You present the argument 
that through willfully ignoring the laws of the universe that you would be immune to it, right? And isn't that so apt for Kasa, right? He, he disregards laws, he disregards reality, and he's kind of, he's so convinced that because of this, he would be immune to it. And she then says, and as you might imagine, your very success poses evidence of that, right? So, and the fact that this guy is still here, the fact that this guy is still alive is kind of almost evidence of the fact that if you ignore the laws of the universe, you will be immune to it. And she finally ends that by saying it, it kind of, it runs contrary to a lifetime of observation, right? For someone like Samardev, who lives in the rational world, who lives in the material world, that a force of nature like Kasa or Long could exist, that somebody could just look at civilization in the eye and say, oh, you know what, I'm not playing, and could just walk away. That seems inconceivable to her because the whole idea of civilization is the idea that we are all in a community and we all agree upon certain basic laws, right? I, I suppose the, the social contract that uh, a lot of people uh, talk about, right? So, Kasa does not believe in a social contract. There is no social contract in the barbaric world, at least from Kasa's point of view. And she says, it's, it's, and, and this is why I need to now, sort of for my own safety, I need to start imprisoning spirits. Kasa has the opposite view, right? To Kasa, he kind of sees this as the natural extension of what a civilized person would do. He was like, no, you, you civilized people, you love enslaving things. You love putting things in chains. You love coming up with all of these justifications to make one person sound better than the other and blah, blah, blah. So even they both agree that Samardev has been corrupted and they both agree that what Samardev did was wrong. But Samardev blames barbarism for it. And Kasa Olong blames civilization for it, uh, which I thought was another interesting sort of thing. And when she when she says all that, when she says, oh, you uh, present the argument, uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, uh, it, it, it contradicts a lifetime of observation and all that, Kasa just says too many words, right? And she says, fine, I'll just put it in simple words, you terrify me. And Kasa even says, yes, but I fascinate you as well. And she kind of says, oh, you, 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 what have you, arrogant bastard or you arrogant jerk or whatever. So once again, this theme of even though barbarism uh, sort of frightens civilization, civilization does have a certain fascination with barbarism as well. And we as the reader too. Uh, what else do I have in my notes here? Oh, yeah. Okay, there's another funny scene, right, where he has the duel with the secular uh, woman and then uh, he kind of beats her pretty easily. He then just walks up to Samardev and he's like, oh, sleep with me, woman. And she just says, get lost, right? She takes none of his shit, like I was saying. He then says, oh, so do I have to find another hoe? And she says, no hoe would come near you, right? Don't flatter yourself. The hoes run away from you. And he then sort of looks at the Segule woman who's getting healed now by the healers. And he's like, maybe she will. And Samardev really gets uh, uh, angry about that. He says, you just broke her arms. And Kasa says, oh, but, but she doesn't need it, right? And besides, they're, they're sort of healing her arms already. So uh, why do you care? And Samadev kind of walks away and she knows that Kasa is teasing her, right? And so she kind of walks away. Samadev, when you think about it, does a lot of this uh, Hermione Granger type shit, right? This uh, bookish girl who likes you but doesn't want to admit it. And she puts up this prickly facade where she's angry at you and she tells you that you're kind of crude and crass or whatever but she likes you beneath the surface, right? Uh, Samardev uh, does all that a lot. There's then the scene with uh, uh, Ubla Lapang, who then comes and meets Kasa. He sees Samardev first and she takes him to see Kasa. The reason I wanted to bring this up was because there's a very, uh, once again, a symbol of how noble Kasa is, where he tells uh, Ublala, right? He says, go gather all your people, okay? And go find me an army. We are now an army and we will take all this down. And Samadev says, listen, he's not a pure blood like you, he's just a mixed blood. And Kasa Olong says, and once again, I have the exact quote here because I didn't want to get it wrong, right? Uh, uh, he basically says uh, that even if they have a single drop of Tobla, one drop of Toblakai blood, then they are Toblakai, right? Uh, now contrast this to what pure bloods would say often, right? Or what human pure bloods in a tribal sense might often say where they tend to discriminate on those whom they perceive not to be pure bloods. This happens all the time, even in the real world, when we see ethnic conflicts and we see 
sort of communities just wiping each other out on a larger on a large scale without really sort of going into mixed heritages and things like that look at the conflict uh, that uh, broke out between the hutus and the tutsis in rwanda right or even look at how uh, tribal rivalries sometimes exacerbate the sunni shia rivalry in the middle east right or even if you look at terror groups that kind of use uh, tribal language in order to appeal to fundamentalism and to recruit people and all that let's say a uh, groups like hezbollah the lashkar e toiba the hezbul mujahideen right uh, even the islamic state uh, all of them whenever they speak about tribe uh, about tribalism right uh, because it's usually theocratic but whenever they speak about tribalism and this uh, you can you find that in uh, afghan politics as well right you find the sense of tribalism in many parts of the world in many different uh, continents uh, so it's it's usually the pure blood so discriminate against those they consider to be water right to, to use a folk uh, analogy again it's the pure blood who claim purity and they claim superiority over the others kasa is the opposite he instead of instead of saying that even a, a drop of impure blood in you will prevent you from being a part of my toblakai army which is what a tyrant or a racist or whatever would have done kasa says if you even have one drop of toblakai in you then you are one of my own you are one of my kin you are one of my people you are one of my followers and i am now your king witness that is sort of kasa along's philosophy and and in that sense once again despite being a barbarian he certainly uh, deserves credit to mirror this uh, scene where uh, kasa along teaches uh, teases her about the segula and she walks away annoyed there's a scene where he uh, uh, he kind of gets jealous and uh, annoyed right so Uh, they have a conversation uh, kasa wants to walk out into the city by himself and samadev says you've got to be crazy right don't do that and he says listen i can do whatever i want and she says okay in that case i'm not interested in hanging out with you i'm going to fo- go find taxilian and he's like is that man your lover now and she's like are you jealous and kasa along says oh no i'm not jealous and before she leaves she kind of just says oh you know what the uh, the senior assessor is more my type the senior assessor is the guy who belongs to the whole one god religion which turns out to be uh, icarium and he has the mask with the uh, with a sort of a laugh painted on it uh, and all that and kasa just goes oh that guy you're disgusting and kind of samardev then uh, laughs and walks away while kasa is the one stamping around jealous so once again there's no clear winner it just keeps going back and forth and it's kind of uh, so enjoyable she is there when kasa finally runs into uh, uh, icarium and she kind of tries to stop him but it doesn't really uh, devolve into a fight right because as we just saw with what he said with ublala he kind of recognizes immediately that uh, uh, that icarium is uh, a jag which means he's half toblakai right and he also sees in icarium's gaze that if it ever comes to a contest of authority between the two of them then he will yield to kasa and kasa even says i'll hold you to that word and icarium says you know how can i not right uh, uh, go by my word and kasa just smiles and and walks away so the icarium kasa thing there's another kind of great scene with them there where the whole things happened and uh, she is uh, samardev is with kasa in the room just before he goes out to face rulad and she's really terrified because by now she is convinced that rulad is unstoppable and kasa feels icarium having disappeared and he just smiles and says good the jag knew that he wasn't needed right he knew that he wasn't needed to take down rulad kasa was enough right this tournament this entire facade will end once kasa gets in there he knows that but she kind of has uh, none of it right so she is uh, terrified for kasa because uh, she believes that even though his will is unshakable because rulad can't really because rulad's immortal that there's no way for kasa to win and kasa just says listen i will kill him i will kill him once and that will be it and he even tells her that when the time comes she needs to release the ghosts in her hand and blah 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 and this then brings us to one of the final scenes that they have together in the book right where and it shows how far along they've come where just before he goes to fight rulad samardev cries she cries for kasa because she's worried about him because he 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 just uh, reveals 
that he knows that this is the cripple god's game all along and that the cripple god wanted him all along right so this is what he says when when uh, samadev tells him the emperor is unstoppable the emperor is immortal the emperor cannot be beaten kasa just says listen you do not understand the emperor is nothing the emperor samadev is not the one he wants right and samadev's like he who i carry him no and then it all drops into place that it's the cripple god and this entire thing the the edor invasion rulard reaching out right uh, the massacres that these people have committed all of that was just a ploy to get kasa all along into this fold because he is the one that the cripple god actually wants and with that revelation she totally sort of uh, breaks down and cries for the first time because she she had, she thought he was fucked and now she knows he's fucked right because now there's a god who's after him and she sees that as a kind of impossible task and they kind of have a touching scene where she's like i know i should hate you but i see you as a friend blah 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 and uh, sort of it it it's a very moving scene because she's crying and even then kasa can't just take it kasa has to be the barbarian in contrast to civilization and as she's crying he goes up women always get weak once a month don't they and she just says oh fuck off right and uh, she kind of punches him a few times and he holds her hands in place and that's the closest that they'll come to a hug so that is their story if there was ever a how i met your mother type sort of uh, retelling of the kasa along summer dev story from where they meet to where they kind of hug and she admits that she likes him and she admits that she cares about him and she starts crying that is the sort of uh, culmination of it after that of course they go in and uh, kasa just makes a fool out of rulard right uh, uh, rulard kind of keeps attacking him and kasa just stands there and just keeps swatting him away rulard who's just decimated everyone else and has been built up kind of like this monster keeps trying to attack kasa from different angles and kasa doesn't even uh, his feet don't even move right and there's even one passage where it describes how rulard is drenched in sweat and kasa is not even out of breath and finally kasa has had enough he kind of uh, he walks in and uh, the sword kind of takes a life of its uh, of its own because let's face it that sword is the key to his immortality that sword is the key to his power so the sword uh, uh, takes on a life of its own and it stabs through kasa's leg and kasa then uses his own sword to just chop rulard through the shoulder right and just severs the arm and the sword from the rest of his body so now uh, rulard is now sort of uh, the, the source of his power has been cut off and samardev uh, summons the ghosts and kasa then gets uh, uh, shipped off to the uh, cripple god's uh, realm right taxilian makes a very good point earlier which samardev doesn't spot that these two swords were destined to meet that rulard's sword and that uh, kasa's flint sword were both destined to meet and if you think about it remember the unbound uh, telling kasa that they could bless that weapon that they could kind of bless it and kasa was like fuck off i don't need your blessings right so all of this was destined uh, kasa and rulard were destined to fight and in the kind of uh, final culmination of this relationship and this story being a contrast between civilization and barbarism kasa just says fuck you to the cripple god the cripple god tells him you alone can handle this you alone can take this power right take it do whatever you want with it you want to destroy civilization do it and kasa just says i don't need your help so all of these uh, people these uh, relatively civilized people who were corrupted by the cripple god and him whispering all these uh, sort of uh, uh, temptations into their ear and in their minds kasa the barbarian because he's so true to his nature as a barbarian he rejects it right because he's so true to his nature as this uh, sort of as someone who genuinely wants to kind of break the shackles around the world stays uh, stays true to that and he kind of just walks away with the cripple god begging him to sort of uh, uh, take that sword so that ends uh, the story guys they do get together and told the hounds again but told the hounds is kind of like their second journey their relationship has become a, a lot more mature then and they become more or less spectators for travelers journey that's a lot more about traveler right in uh, 
told the hounds and they also have sort of their own problems where uh, summer dev is uh, uh, there's this bear god which kind of is following her around and uh, that thing is uh, lost in memory and casa has a conversation with the uh, shadow throne and cotillion which kind of uh, uh, completely changes his outlook on the tableau and what he wants to do next so this whole idea of uh, civilization and barbarism doesn't really get explored as much it's these two uh, books in uh, the bone hunters and reapers gale where we see this being a microcosm for civilization and barbarism and we also see this love story where this barbarian saves this witch the scholar and witch uh, and she starts hating him and he starts doubting her and as they go through all this together even though there's so much other stuff going on the two of them come together naturally where he kind of he even says you teach me a lot about women right so once again where she as the embodiment of civilization brings out a side in him that he didn't know existed and he as a barbarian brings out a side in her right which uh, she didn't know existed so that really is the story of kasa along and summer dev so that ends the video guys i just realized i made a couple of mistakes so i need to kind of uh, patch them up as well uh, i just like you guys to let me know how you like the format because clearly this video was over an hour long and not a lot of people can probably handle that even and even i can probably only do a couple of videos like this so did you prefer the previous format of a let's say a 25 minute video that speaks about something specific like the morality of the folklore sale or do you guys prefer these longer videos that might stretch out to even an hour where we kind of do a deep dive and we follow the journey of these characters because uh, i'm not too sure if my sort of style of recounting these stories was even entertaining or illuminating for any of you so uh, just let me know whether you prefer the older format or this longer format or whether you'd like uh, there to be a mix between the two right because i did make a couple of mistakes in this video today which i now have to go back and kind of just put uh, uh, edits into but this is what happens when you function with rough notes and you want to speak for an hour right uh, uh, these are the risks so i hope you guys enjoyed that and i'll see you guys next time thank you very much